Uh, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Edith Chapin of NPR. Um, for many of you, if you have been to Skull Forums before, Professor Michael Porter needs no introduction, but um, let me try anyway. He defies labels. Uh, he is a man of many talents. He can be an economist, a researcher, an author, advisor, and of course he's a teacher at Harvard Business School where he's famous for his work on strategy. In this day and age, the term thought leader is grossly overused, but in this case, it's very applicable. I hope you have cleared your minds because you are in for a thought-provoking and provocative presentation. Following Professor Porter's presentation, I will ask a question, maybe two, but the most important thing is to get to your questions. So there are microphones that will roam around as they have at many of these panels if you've been in this auditorium before. Please do wait for the microphone, uh, but I will call on you. So with that housekeeping out of the way, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Michael Porter. Edith, thank you. Uh, that was extremely generous, and uh, particularly today, I'm a little nervous about that introduction because uh, uh, today I'm, I'm doing something that um, I, you know, very very rarely do. I'm going to talk about something really for the first time. Uh, I got about 18 months ago. Uh, I was based on a lot of other work I'd done uh, related to the agenda of Skoll and. Uh, uh, I, I started getting pulled in an entirely new direction uh, of, of work. Um, and uh, I did have, hopefully, some skills to bring to bear to that new direction, but, uh, but it's a field in which I'd never worked. It's a field in which thousands of other people do work. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and so I stand here today with, with great discomfort. Uh, I'm, I'm used to talking about stuff I really, really understand. But I think today's session uh, uh, is, is an e effort to open up another front in this whole question of how do we advance society. You know, everybody in this room is here because we all care about advancing society. That's what we do. Uh, we do it in a variety of different ways. So many of you do it uh, uh, through social entrepreneurship. You know, I do it through my, my research and my uh, pr uh, practice out in the field. Uh, all of us uh, does it in a different way. We care about lots of different aspects of, of society, but uh, we're all trying to advance it. That's, that's what we're all about. And as I uh, continued to work in this field, particularly over the last several decades, I started to become convinced that uh, it was getting really, really hard to advance society. Uh, in some very fundamental and important respects that I'd really never even considered. And, and so what I'd like to talk today uh, about is this, uh, this pull uh, and this new territory. I don't, I don't want to keep you in suspense, but, but I, I, I do want to uh, lay some groundwork first. Uh, and then I'd like to sort of open up uh, the, the question uh, that, I, that I hope to shed some light on today. And, uh, and, and, and Edith, I'm not sure I'm a thought leader <laughs> on this topic, but it's something that I have come to believe is fundamental. And it's something that I've come to believe that every one of us in this room has to get engaged in. And yet most of us are not. And in fact, some of us think that if we get engaged in this topic, it's going to detract from what we really care about doing, which is advancing society. I think that the, 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 the stage for this discussion has already been set uh, in, in this school meeting, uh, just in the halls, listening to the sessions. Uh, we've talked a lot about populism. We just had a whole session on it uh, as an important phenomenon that's really uh, affecting uh, how, how societies uh, uh, operate, uh, how people converse, trust between citizens. Uh, uh, a, a sense of hostility that has grown uh, uh, in many societies and, and for sure in the United States. Uh, hostilities among ourselves, Americans against Americans, 
uh, this is a conversation that's been happening here at Skoll for the last uh, few days, uh, and uh, I think all of you have participated in that con conversation. Um, as, we, as we think about that conversation, it, it's kind of reflecting some uh, sort of deeper uh, forces that seem to be at work right now. Uh, a sense of discontent, uh, of unequal opportunity, um, a strange disconnect between conversation and reality. Um, a sense that many citizens in many countries really don't understand what's in their interest. I mean, I think of the discussion we had in education in America about the common core. Common core was a way of measuring educational attainment. It was going to be a consistent uh, measure of educational uh, progress across states. It was all about uh, creating a way of measuring whether children were building the skills they needed to actually succeed in whatever they were going to do next. Uh, but Common Core became a divisive, bitter issue, and many parents in horrendously underperforming school districts all across America became angry and mobilized a lot of forces against the Common Core, and it got dropped. So what more is in those parents' interests than having educational quality improve? And what, what more way of doing that that we, that we know about is, is actually, actually seeing how well we're doing and using that to improve. But, but actually, many citizens thought that was, that was wrong. We're having a debate now about trade. And we have a lot of people believing that if we protect our country, its economy, we will be more prosperous. Well, we know that that won't be true. Uh, We've known that for decades. We tried that. It didn't work. It almost brought the whole world down in terms of the world economy. But we have people believing that that's in their interest, that they should be for that. And there's a lot of that today. We have very divisive elections and campaigns. We have people who are deep outsiders who are starting to uh, win. And I won't mention the T name. But it's all about being an outsider. It's not about, it's, it's not about anything else in, in that particular case. We, got, we have citizens thinking that other citizens are the problem. Rather than, I think, the historical view, particularly in America, that we're all citizens, we get along, we, we work together, we try to build a better society for all of us. Um, you know, we respect others in our society. Uh, we're, we're, we're having this... This, this, this fear and divisiveness uh, crop up. Uh, citizens are not trusting institutions that are critical, like our democracy. Uh, people think democracy is rigged. Somehow the game is, 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 not, is not working, so they're not participating. 40% of the people didn't vote in the last presidential election in the United States of America. And mo a lot of them will say, gee, I don't, it's... it's I don't want to participate in this. And, and this is really the punchline. If we look around, if we look at America and we look at a lot of other countries, what we're seeing is what is sometimes called gridlock. We are just not able to move the ball forward on things we know we have to do on things where actually the majority agrees. And this is what drew, draw me, drew me to this issue that I like to talk about. And this issue is politics. The last person sitting in this room who I would have thought would do work on politics is me. I am the orthogonal actor to politics. I'm about content, I'm about theory, I'm about frameworks, I'm about structure, I'm about reality, I'm about facts, I'm about measurement, you know. And I'm not about politics. I never participated in politics. I do vote. Uh, but I believe that we must engage 
in politics, wherever we're from, if we're going to achieve our goal of being its goal, which is to advance society. I believe that the major barrier to advancing society today is not concepts. It's not knowing what to do. It's not good policy uh, recommendations. It's politics. And that's why I was pulled, kicking and screaming, into looking at this question. Uh, and so let me tell you a story about my journey here. It's a story mostly about America because I've been deeply involved in work about America for the last six years when Harvard Business School took on a major project on US competitiveness. Because we saw some very frightening trends in the US economy that had been building for quite some time that were undermining our growth and that were creating this growing uh, divergence between uh, uh, you know, lower income, higher income, high skill, low skill, small business, big business. And we felt as a academic institution based in America that we had a responsibility to engage in this issue. So I started down this path of looking at US competitiveness. And, and, and as I went through that journey, by the end of that journey, I came to the conclusion we know exactly what to do to restore American competitiveness. We know exactly what to do to start on the path of reversing inequality. We know what to do. We're just not doing it. And not only that, we haven't been doing it for decades. And that doesn't only apply to economic policy, it also applies to many of the most important social uh, issues we have to address and social agendas, like health care, like gun violence, like public education. We've lost the capacity to progress. We're spinning. We're not going anywhere. Now, Fortunately for the rest of the world, many of your countries are doing much better than the United States. You are making progress. One of the problems we have in the United States is not that, that, that uh, it's, 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 it's our lack of progress compared to the fact that many other countries are doing forward-thinking policy agendas. Uh, so uh, other countries are doing a little bit better. And I'd like you to think about your own country and, and, and whatever level of success you feel like you're having in terms of moving the ball forward in the society, dealing with the important issues, uh, you know, kind of resolving the, uh, the issues in a positive way and coming up with solutions that will actually move the country forward, your country forward. Uh, all of you are going to be in a little different place, but I'd like to tell a story about America because I think we're kind of a, at a very, very pivotal moment in our history, um, and uh, it's leading to uh, an America that I don't even recognize most of the time. And I think at the core of it is not policy ideas, <laughs> it's not knowing what to do, it's not even the private sector. We have an enormous engagement of the private sector in America in philanthropy, in social issues, in social entrepreneurship. Businesses are working harder than ever to try to move the needle forward in so many ways on social issues. But we're stuck. And I think fundamentally we're stuck because of politics. But most of us have really not very, thought very hard about politics. You know, we, 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 we kind of think enough about it to get frustrated. Uh, but what, what's going on here? I mean, the American Republic was a political innovation of immense proportions in the world. Our political system has been extremely innovative over the years in driving agenda after agenda after agenda. You know, starting from universal private uh, public education to you know, uh, you know, interstate highway system to massively good infrastructure to all kinds of things spit out of our political system that were incredibly 
important to the progress and success that the country has had over the years. But now, we've come to a screeching halt. And we've had this staggering election that none of us can believe. Except uh, the people that have had completely lost trust with this whole institution called politics and how we uh, resolve and advance issues in America. So let's talk a little bit about my journey very briefly, kind of the reasons why I think this is the first order issue now. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about what the work that we've done now on political system uh, is starting to reveal, uh, what it suggests in terms of what we need to do about that. Uh, and, and I would tell you that uh, what I would say that every one of us in this room, uh, particularly all of us Americans in this room, but probably many more, because I think a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about, there's echoes of them all over. <laughs> and there has been, uh, historically, uh, this, this picture has, 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 this movie has played itself in many other countries. Uh, the, I believe now every one of us has to engage in our political system. Rather than the tendency over the last you know, 10 or 20 years, I find, to, for people like us to disengage. Uh, and just let it go because we think it's kind of a natural thing. It's going to just take care of itself. No, 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 no. That's what I'd like to talk about today. And it's very scary uh, because uh, I think we have some very, we have a good insight into, I think, what's going on. I hope you'll tell me. Uh, I think we're starting to understand what we need to do. Uh, but it's something that we haven't really Done, And I think it's our next big agenda if what we want to do is advance society in the societies in which we live and work. So uh, in terms of, of, of development advancing society, we know that there's really two big buckets. One is economic development, how to boost prosperity. Uh, we've uh, importantly understood that economic development is not just about the average GDP, it's also about improving the distribution of GDP, uh, having prosperity that is shared. Uh, uh, this whole issue of inequality has taught us that when we think about economic development, we have to open up our thinking a little bit beyond the traditional models. Um, but we also know, and this is something that uh, we, I personally have been very deeply involved in with my colleagues from Social Progress Initiative, we also understand that it's not just economic development. We have to go beyond just economic development. We have to think about social progress. And so of you, hopefully many of you are aware of the social progress imperative and the social progress index and the work we've done to try to capture uh, how do we measure success beyond just economic success, beyond GDP? How do we measure kind of whether society is getting better, whether citizens have a better life and, and a better sense of opportunity? Uh, in terms of uh, how this all works, we, uh, I think traditionally the view is if we can just get economic development to succeed and have more uh, income, then, we can, then the social stuff takes care of itself. What we've learned and what I think all of you would know is no, it doesn't work that way. Yes, economic success helps provide resources and uh, the environment for social progress, but it doesn't determine it. There's a big gap between the left and the right here of the chart. Uh, so the, it's not just an arrow pointing that way, it's also an arrow pointing that way. We know that if we can't move ahead on social progress in, in areas like education and, and, and many others, then ultimately it's going to constrain our ability to economically develop our society uh, and provide a shared prosperity for, for all citizens. Uh, and this two-way relationship between economic development and social progress is something that we are deeply engaged in and we will continue to be deeply engaged in for the foreseeable future. Because it's, in a sense, it's a whole new chapter of thinking about economic development uh, and social development. We've, we've got to see how these two fit together. Um, as, we, as we think about uh, uh, social progress, uh, uh, society and economic development and social progress, let me tell very briefly the story of America here, updated till today. 
And, 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 and what, as I tell that story, uh, I'm telling this story not to uh, repeat things that you already know, but simply to lay the groundwork for why I think we have to add this new dimension to our thinking uh, that I talked about a bit, a bit ago. So on the economic development side, uh, this, this is familiar ground. I think most, well, many of the people in this room are not economic developers, but I think you're all familiar with uh, the thinking about economic development. Uh, increasingly, we understand that economic development requires that we enhance competitiveness. Uh, competitiveness is when firms based in a, uh, an economy can compete, uh, both domestically and inter internationally, but also citizens are able to enjoy a, uh, a high and rising standard of living. Uh, we now understand that economic development is both. It's not just firms, it's not just about companies, it's also about citizens. And true competitiveness is when we can advance both firms and citizens. It's not a contest. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an ultimate synergy. We're successful if both firms and citizens can win. If only one wins, we fail. Uh, we understand that in order to create successful uh, economic development, we have to improve productivity. Unless you're more productive, you can't support a higher income. That's just the iron law of the modern market economy. Uh, and so we need to drive productivity growth. We not only have to make the workers that are already working uh, productive, but we've got to create an environment where all the people that want to work of working age can be part of the workforce. We want as many people working as want to work uh, uh, and, and working productively so that that allows the productivity of the entire economy to go up. Again, this is kind of economic development, kind of core concepts. Uh, we also know that productivity uh, and the ability to grow productivity depends on the quality of the business environment that we create in a society. Uh, it depends on the composition of the economy uh, and something called clusters, which I won't uh, try to cover today, but is a kind of a critical new dimension to economic development. It's building concentrations of, of businesses in particular fields where we can actually have a critical mass. And also, uh, productivity depends on firms. And you can't have a productive economy unless the companies are productive, unless they're using modern, sophisticated techniques to manage and set strategy and run their supply chains and, and all of that. All of this is kind of core economic development thinking. We at Harvard Business School applied all this thinking to the United States of America, starting about six years ago. And the reason that we got concerned about this is if you looked at a variety of measures that really capture economic progress and economic success, we found some truly chilling data. And this is one of them. America has traditionally been a highly productive economy. We've had an ability to grow productivity very, very rapidly. But if you, if you look at what's been happening, except for a few exceptional periods in the past, we've seen a kind of continued slide in the productivity growth in the American economy. Uh, we've never seen this before. All the experts are puzzled. What's going on? Uh, you've all heard about job growth. Job growth in America used to be like a clock. You know. Job, 2% job growth every year. It happened for decade after decade after decade after decade. This, this chart doesn't, I, I left out that chart. I had to cut a lot of the wonderful things I'd like to show you. But, but job growth has slowed down. Uh, now, if you read the New York Times, it'll say that we have low unemployment rate. <laughs> but we actually don't. Because what we're doing is we're only measuring the people that are actively looking for jobs. And what we have now is a historic, in the last decades, decline in the number of people even trying to work of working age. They're, they're just not involved. They've given up. So our real unemployment rate is closer to 10%, not so-called 4.7. Uh, you know, there's been this sense that we're, ha we're having a recovery, and there's lots of indicators that say we're not really having a recovery in America. We're just bumping along. Bumping along. Workforce participation is, is one of those staggering trends that we now see. Uh, and you see that start, that didn't start at the, in, in the financial crisis. That started well before. That started in 1997. 
as we look at all the data on America, a lot of things started in 1997, 1995, 1999, 2000. Things started moving in the wrong direction about 20 years ago, 10 to 20 years ago in the American economy. Income growth. Historically, incomes used to grow in America. These are real incomes. That's why the numbers look a little low. Real income growth, uh, historically, you can see from 1967 to 1997, all classes of incomes grew income in America. Uh, but then if you look in this case in 1999, we see this fundamental break in a long-term trend. All of a sudden, incomes are not growing. Uh, they're actually declining. That's not just the poor people. That's the middle-income people. That's the 90th percentile has not grown real income since 1999. Uh, uh, wow. The, the, the 1% maybe has grown a little income, but even the 1% is bouncing up and down wildly. Uh, they got a lot of money, so we don't feel sorry for them. <laughs> but but they're not, it's, not, it's not going uh, in the direction that we're used to having it going. As we look at the US economy, we're seeing that something that other economies have, have seen as well. We're seeing sort of a bifurcation of the economy. If you're a highly skilled professional, you're doing well. There's lots of opportunity for people like that. They're clamoring for, you know, clamoring for people that, that can do computer science or you know, have MBAs from top schools or whatever. Okay? If you're middle and lower skilled, you're struggling. It's the same America. Okay? This is true in a lot of different countries. We're also seeing that if you're a large multinational, you're doing quite well. American multinationals have done, done quite well uh, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, for decades, and they're still doing quite well. But if you're a small business just doing business in America, it's really tough, really tough. Some of those small business people got a little more optimistic when Mr. T was elected. But their optimism is starting to fade again. And now they're feeling more pessimistic again. They're not investing. They're not hiring. The job generation in America today is mostly by the larger companies. Staggering for our economy. It's just not the way it's worked. This is why we, we at the school, we were so concerned about this. There's a lot of, there's some really successful high-tech startups. It turns out that almost all the high-tech startups in America come from like 10 zip codes. Elsewhere in the country, there's more firms dying than there are firms being created. So economic, the economic trajectory of the US has gotten onto a very different path. Uh, at HBS, we love matrices. <laughs> and this is, this is one that we did a survey of all of our HBS alumni, thousands of them all around the world, in, many of them in se senior management positions. And this was kind of their assessment of where the US stood in terms of strengths and weaknesses in ter uh, for purposes of thinking about competitiveness. And the good news is that there's these uh, wonderful green things. Uh, oops. These wonderful green things. Uh, there must be a, but, whoops, I goofed up again. Whoops, I got to go this way. No, I got to go back this way. There we go. So up in the upper right-hand corner, I was hoping to use the laser pointer, but I can't find it. Uh, the stuff up in the upper right-hand corner, we have strengths in America. And they're pretty robust. They're being sustained. But stuff that used to be strengths is falling into the weakness category. And stuff that's fallen into the weakness category, some of it is de de eroding so rapidly that it's deteriorating. So it's, we're weak and deteriorating. You know, public education, there's lots of measures. Our PISA, our PISA scores every time are lower than they were before. Whereas most of the countries that here are not Americans, your PISA scores are going up, uh, or a lot of them are. Uh, and you can sort of look at the things in, in the red zone there. By the way, note. The biggest weakness identified by our alumni, they saw this before we did. They said, our biggest weakness is our political system. 
Our biggest weakness is our political system. And if we don't pay attention to that, we're going to be having trouble fixing this. Uh, out of this work at HBS, we had a team of faculty, and, and we sat down and we developed an action plan. What do we do in America to change the tide here? What are, we, what are the priorities? What are the things we could do soon that, that would have a big impact, that would have, a, that, that have an impact fairly soon, not 20 years from now? And we came up with what we call affectionately the eight-point plan. There they are. If you go down that list, all these things are pretty self-evident. Okay, we got to fix our corporate taxes so we have the highest, you know, corporate tax in the world uh, from any, for any advanced country. Uh, we are a total outlier in our tax system. The last time we reformed our tax code in America for, for corporations was 30 years ago. Other countries have been refining their tax codes. We're now way out of whack. We got to fix this, and, and so on. You know what we found? We surveyed our alumni and said, do you agree with these things? And they said, yeah, overwhelmingly, 80%, 90%. Then we tried something that we'd never done before. We surveyed the general public. We said, what do you think, general public? Does this make sense to you? Uh, and you know, in general, they said yes. 75% of the general public were for corporate tax reform. Because they understood, they'd figured out that the reason we have tax inversions <laughs> is because we're out of sync. And they don't want their company to be bought by a, you know, a foreign company. They, 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 they think we can do perfectly well as, as Americans. So a, a lot of consensus about this. And then the faithful recognition came that if we looked at these eight things, first of all, there's endless discussion of all these things in America. Everything here. But you know what? We've had no significant progress on any of them in at least 20 years. Nothing. No meaningful tax reform, no meaningful budget reform, no meaningful infrastructure uh, advancement, no meaningful regulatory streamlining, which every country needs to do every so often. Nothing. And this is, this is when I started feeling, look, we did all this work. Doesn't matter. Nothing's happening. The problem isn't what to do. The problem isn't not, not even having a consensus on what to do. The problem is somewhere else. It has to be on the process by which we get things done in the society. And what's that process? Well, luckily, a lot of the things in our society we can do in the private sector. And the private sector is trying really hard. But unfortunately, we need government to get things done. And we're not getting anything done. So why is that? The same issues really apply to social progress. You all have heard, hopefully know about the Social Progress Index. The, the, I'll, these slides will be posted. Uh, I, I'll cover this very quickly. But you know, the question is, how do we measure whether our society is progressing on the non-economic Dimensions. Now, some of them relate to the economic, but these are non-economic things that have to do with people's capabilities, their well-being, their quality of life, uh, and whether they're living in the society that's a healthy society that allows people to, uh, you know, achieve opportunity and live the way they want and make their own choices. And 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 this framework is kind of the overall architecture of the uh, social progress index uh, in these three buckets. Um, and uh, the actual index itself is based on 54 you know, hard data indicators of how a society is doing on all of these areas. Uh, and again, we've presented that before. The, the 2017 version, uh, which we're very proud of, will be issued in, in next month, in, in about a month. Um, 
So uh, this is the 16 ranking. This is the top 50 countries. Um, and you, you can look down the list. You're not going to maybe be shocked by any of the countries in the left-hand side uh, and how they're different from the ones on the right-hand side. Um, the one thing I want you to just note is, where's the US? We're not even in the first column on social progress. Now, how do Americans think about themselves? Oh my gosh, you know, we were a pioneer on all kinds of social areas. Uh, you know, we think of ourselves as leaders on social progress. But it turned out that we, when we had data to look at it, uh, and this is all recent statistics. Now, I, if we could measure American social progress in the year 1950, it would be very different. And so would all the other countries. But today, we're not doing so well. And, and if we, if we kind of uh, kinda look at how the world is doing, this is just a quick point I want to make. This, this data says, what if, the, what, if the world, what if all the countries in the world were the world? If we added up all the scores for all the countries and looked at how the world is doing on all these measures, how's the world doing? And what we found very interesting about this exercise was Look at where the world's doing the worst. It's all what we call opportunity. Uh, uh, personal rights. Tolerance and inclusion. And as you'll see, the US isn't doing well there either, even though we were supposed to be the place where there was all the rights and freedoms. Uh, if you compare the U.S. to the other uh, countries in the G7, you know, we're number, uh, you know, four or five in income. But we're number 19 on social progress. We're an underperformer. We're not using our wealth productively to improve society in the U.S. Uh, compared to other countries. Uh, we are a laggard among advanced economies not a leader. It's not the way Americans think about themselves. Uh, we have this pathological view that we're good and leaders. And here we're not so good. And this was one of the very striking findings of uh, the social progress work. And uh, uh, we've identified a lot of other interesting findings as well, which uh, hopefully you will uh, read about. Uh, this is impossible to read. But this takes, this takes all the 54 indicators, all the 54 under the buckets, and says, how, how are we doing in the US compared to our economic peers? These are the 15 countries closest to the US in terms of uh, income, GDP per capita, OK? Sort of peer-to-peer -peer comparison. And red means we're significantly behind. <laughs> The peers. Yellow means we're eh. And green means we're actually better. Not much green. Fair amount of yellow, a lot of red. OK? And if you take the reds and look at the greatest weaknesses of the US on social progress, you get this list on the left side. Now let's think about how much progress we're making on those issues. <laughs> what just happened in healthcare <laughs> in America? We've had a 15 year guerrilla war to not do anything. <laughs> and we just went through another episode of that particular guerrilla war. Uh, in environmental policy, we're still debating climate change and all kinds of other stuff. In education reform, we're still nowhere. <laughs> we're stalled. Uh, on you know, gun violence, we're stalled. We got people thinking that they have a perfect right and they should be able to have automatic weapons anytime they want. And we got other people who think that, well, nobody should ever have a gun ever again. Only the police. 
And we're just getting nowhere. We're just stuck on this, this debate between people that have very different views. And of course, the staggering thing for America is this problem in terms of tolerance and, and inclusion. And you know, look at the dialogue we're having on immigration and on immigrants. Uh, you know, look at the dialogue we're having in so many areas around our fellow citizens. And who's, who's to blame and, and, and who's the enemy. You know, race. We're not making any progress, or not as much progress as we could and should on race, racial relations. How can we, how can we actually have a productive dialogue about that? It's not either the, it's not the police versus the community or the community versus the police. It's, it's you know, we're, we're all citizens of the United States of America and, and we, should, uh, we should start pragmatically thinking about what are the solutions here? What can we actually get done? And yet we seem stuck on that discussion as well. So you can see, as somebody who's been deeply immersed in policy and agendas for the country, boy, this is really, really depressing. Because what it says is all this research we've done and all this policy work and all this data and all this advancement in thinking and nothing's happening. It's useless. It doesn't matter. So at this point, um, couldn't, couldn't avoid it any longer. <laughs> Why can't we get anything done? What's wrong? And this is not just Washington, it's also the states. We have a lot of states that are completely stuck as well. Gridlocked, polarized, citizen against citizen. And you know, came, we came to the conclusion that the political system is our biggest, biggest problem. So if it's our biggest problem, we better get busy. We better, we better dig in. We better look at it. it. Wasn't always this way, too. That's another thing. America had a pretty productive political system historically, but now we're just stuck. I, I don't mean to be negative here or demeaning to anybody, but America feels like a third world country now, where the, where the tribes are fighting against each other. And the net result is we can't be productive. We can't have a productive society. We can't move ahead. And I'm not blaming any third world countries for that. They've got a lot of challenges that create that structure. But in an advanced economy like the United States, how could that be happening to us? So we started looking at the political system in the United States of America. And this has been a really interesting and uh, in some ways very sobering exercise. Uh, how do we... How do we see the political system. And, and the first thing I would tell you is, what we found is Washington isn't broken. It's, the results we're getting is exactly the results that it's designed to deliver. Washington and our political system is not designed to deliver solutions. In fact, it's designed not to deliver solutions. Because if we solve a problem, the political actors lose. <laughs> they lose support, they, lo they lose partisan supporters, they lose donations. Our system is not designed to deliver solutions. It's actually designed to advance the interest of the system itself, of the actors, starting with our political parties. I don't believe that parties are bad inherently. I don't believe that anybody in America that's in the political system is evil. But we've allowed ourselves to be caught in a system that is failing. Where the system is delivering in a way that benefits the system, but not the public interest. There's no accountability. We have an example in, in a paper that, uh, that will be published uh, hopefully in the next few weeks uh, of uh, Simpson Bowles. I don't know if you all remember Simpson Bowles. Simpson Bowles was an effort to build a con 
co consensus and a compromise around the budget. And, um, um, and uh, uh, it was a great compromise. It was fair. It took into account everybody's points of view. Uh, and uh, the, the commission put out their report. And then it died. Obama, uh, President Obama c created the commission, but he walked away from the, from the solution. Paul Ryan was on the commission, and he walked away from the solution and wouldn't vote. And here, here was the accountability. <laughs> President Obama got reelected, and Ryan got to be Speaker of the House. No accountability. Nobody's holding our political system accountable for the results it's actually able to achieve. There's no regulation. There's nobody looking out for the public interest. There's no regulator of the political system. Whatever they do, they just decide to do. There's no regulation. And the other thing that you probably may know, but the political system is thriving. The parties are booming. Spending is growing. The incomes and influence of, of, of the people that work in the political processes, they have lots of more opportunity now than they've ever had before. Lobbying is hugely expanded. The media are just literally ecstatic about how things are going because it's been so good for them in terms of people watching TV and, uh, and you, know, uh, you know, participating online in, in the political dialogue. We've got a structural problem. We've allowed the political system to be designed in a way that's not aligned with the public interest. We didn't do it deliberately. It stuck up on us. The actors in the political system created a lot of rules and practices that, that have created the situation we are in today. Uh, it's a structural problem. Almost nothing about our political system in America is, is mentioned in the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution about partisan primaries. There's nothing in the Constitution about how you structure the Senate and the House in terms of who the committee chairs are and what powers they have to take votes or not take votes. All that has been created by the actors in the system. And the actors in the system have been very good at creating a system that works for them but not for us. So let's spend just a little more time on that, and then I know we have to open up for, for questions. What do we want the political system to achieve? What we want is good results. What we want is solutions to problems, the problems that matter. We want to move forward. We want the political system to sift and sort the legitimate viewpoints of lots of different people in our society. We're a democracy. And no issue is simple. Ideology is never correct. Ideology is never correct. It's never big government or small government. It's never free trade or protectionism. The, the ideological answer is always wrong. And the, the reality and the real answer is always a blend. It's always a synthesis. It's always a, a search for blending and, and integrating the real complexity of the real issues and the real influences on what we need to do as a society. That's what we want our political system to do. If, if somebody else doesn't agree with us, that doesn't mean we can ignore them. In a good political system, the, the interest of, of our citizens need to be taken into consideration. And, and our system in America used to be pretty good at that. Sorting out the points of view and helping people, uh, you know, help creating reconciliation. We had a, we had a Congress uh, that was pretty good at, at, at working together and, and collaborating to do that. A good political system inevitably has to involve the, the search for common ground and the, need, and the need for compromise. It's the only way to act for it actually to work. And again, America was pretty good at that. But today, it's not the way we operate in politics in America. It's all about ideology. It's all about 
forgive me here, ridiculous party platforms that are full of platitudes and ideology, uh, a lot of false promises that will never ke be kept, a lot of um, false choices, either or choices that really aren't even either or choices. It's always a blend, it's always a synthesis. Uh, our political system is all about dividing us. And the parties want to divide us because that makes us supporters of that party. That makes us loyal. That makes us vote for what the party wants us to vote. Uh, it's not about solutions. It's not about moving the ball. It's not about finding the common ground and moving on that. In fact, in today's political system, uh, even where there's common ground, it doesn't get done. <laughs> because the party mindset and the political mindset now is if you even show any hint of compromise on anything, you get tagged as not you know, a real loyal party supporter. Uh, and this, I could give you hundreds of examples here. Even where we agree we don't do things because of the, the, the nature of the political rivalry that we've created. You know, one of, one of the consequences of the way the political system in America has been structured is there's no more moderates. They don't exist. And the ones that are still left quit. They give up. Some of our most distinguished political leaders in America, in both the House and the Senate, over the last 15 years, have literally quit. I don't want to do this anymore. It's not getting us anywhere. This is not why I ran for election. What has caused this polarization? Why do we not have any moderates anymore? What's going on? That, that's a fascinating question. And to answer that question, we have to think about uh, uh, the political system as an industry. And, uh, you know, everybody here is, you know, you're going to boo or something here. <laughs> but this is an industry. This is not public. This is not a public institution. This is, this is an institution consisting of private gain-seeking actors. None of this is specified in the law or the Constitution. There's no independent regulator that makes sure that this serves the public interest. It's an industry. It's about a $30 billion industry at this point. That's how much money uh, is flowing in this area. And that's, not just, that's just not donations. Don't think of that money as just bad money that's trying to influence votes. Think of it also as just all the money to pay for all these people that are doing this. We have an industry in America where, where we have two dominant parties. In business, we call that a duopoly. And in business thinking, a duopoly is something that we get nervous about. Because when there's only two dominant competitors, and by the way, there's not been a new party of any significance whatsoever in America for 140 years. No new competition ever. Really. So what we have here is an industry with extremely high barriers to entry. It's almost impossible to form a new party with a different point of view. The last time it happened was the Civil War. That's when the Republicans were, were born. And the other second party died away because it was viewed as irrelevant at that point. Hasn't happened since. It's almost impossible for an independent, not affiliated with one of the parties to actually get elected. And even if they get elected, it's virtually impossible for them to have any influence whatever in the House or the Senate or the state legislature, because they're not part of the party. It's an industry. Now, again, don't boo. I, I, I read a lot of stuff about political competition. I, re I read a lot of stuff here, and what I found was that there's a lot of good research on the political system, but the ability to step back and understand the overall structure 
and how it works and how it drives competition, this is not the kind of lens that we've been using to look at politics. But if we use that lens, and if we think about, you know, who, who are the customers that our political system serves? Well, uh, let's just take that one. Right now, the average voter has no power whatsoever in politics. It's not none. The, the voters with influence are the ones uh, that are, that are they're, they're primary voters, which are the kind of rabid partisans. 10% of the people, 10% vote in the primary. So 10% get to decide who's going to be on the general election ballot. Um, the people that give a lot of money, and they tend to be special interests. The whole party structure and the whole party competition is designed to sift and sort the special interests. One party has their special interests, the other party has their special interests, and essentially what they do is appeal to those folks as their base, and they whip them up into a frenzy, uh, and the primary process sorts among the various candidates the ones that are most rabid and most partisan, and that's why there's no independents anymore and no moderates, and that's, that's the nature of the competition. Is it any wonder that we don't get anything done? Is it any wonder that we're stuck? Is it any wonder that there's no new ideas and no new energy and no positivity in this system? And, 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 and the sad answer, I believe, is no. We're getting what the system was designed to create, but it wasn't designed by us. <laughs> It was designed by the actors in the system. And we didn't even notice. We elected these people, and they created this. Okay, now once again, I just want to be clear. I am not, I'm not being critical here of any individual political leader. I, I, I think most people go into politics to do public service. But the kind of people that go in, and the races they have to run, and what the process they have to, to participate in to win elections, and, and, and the way we've organized the governing in the Congress and the state legislatures, uh, ends up with a set of people that do this. They're not bad people. Uh, but the system has been designed in a way that is giving us the result that we've gotten. And one final point about this is that if you look at the changes in our political system in America over the last 20 or 30 or 40 years, it's moved more and more and more in this direction. It used to be different. For example, we didn't used to have partisan primaries in America. Most Americans probably can't believe that. They just, that's, that's just natural. Well, no, it isn't natural. Partisan primaries were created by the parties, and so were caucuses, where the person that gets on the ballot gets decided by a small group of people that are the most rabid insiders. And the people that get on the ballot don't have to, to stand election with the average person and appeal to the average voter. Average voter doesn't matter uh, in terms of who is on the general election ballot. So what you get is two people on the general election ballot that are extremes. And then 40% of the American people look at the two people on the general election ballot and say, uh-uh, I don't want to vote for these, these guys. They're not for me. So we have more people drop out. And as more people drop out, who gets more power? The people who are in. Okay, it's a, it, it's a, so that, that, this is where we are. Now, uh, now hopefully everybody's not completely depressed. <laughs> because we can do something about this. Uh, and uh, what I believe is the, the, the strategy here is we're going to have to take some critical steps to take back our democracy and to make it work for us. And this slide uh, talks about what those key steps are. Again, I'm out of time. Probably negative time. Uh, one of the, the most powerful single thing is to get rid of partisan primaries. So there's one primary. Anybody can run. The top two or four vote getters get to go to the general election. That means that people that are going to get through the primary are going to have to appeal to a, a pretty good base of people. 
They're not just appealing to the 10% of the Repu Republicans who vote, or Democrats. Uh, is that a pipe dream? Well, two states in America, California and Washington, have kicked out prim partisan primaries and moved to the uh, nonpartisan primary. Okay? And they did it through ballot initiatives. Uh, if we can get more and more states moving in this direction, it will change everything. We won't have partisanship in anything like the way we do today. We won't, we won't have this bitter, ugly, negative dialogue. Uh, you know, gerrymandering is playing around with the congressional districts to create safe seats. Now, 90% of all the seats in the House of Representatives are safe. That is, it's impossible for the other side to win. So that means that the person who wins the primary wins the general. We've got to change that. Uh, the parties now control the leg legislative process. To get voted on, not, not who wins, to get voted on in the Congress, you know who decides what gets voted on? The party leaders of the party in power. You could, have, you could have the best idea in the world that you could actually pass, but unless the party leaders put it up for a vote, it doesn't even get voted on. We've allowed the governing rules in the Congress to be captured by politicians, by party people, not by what's fair, what's democratic, you know, any reasonable bill decide, deserves a vote, a vote on the record, things like that. that that's all been uh, uh, a control. So we've got to change that legislative process. That's not going to be easy, but there's some good strategies for doing that. Uh, there's a lot of loopholes in, in, in fundraising. Fundraising per se is not the fundamental problem. We think even without without Citizens United, we'd still have this problem. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of good ideas out there, like term limits and things like that, that people talk about, or, or giving people better civics education. There's all kinds of proposals for political reform. But what we have to understand is the proposals that will really make a difference are the proposals that are fundamentally changing the structure of the political competition that I talked about earlier. And the problem with term limits is it doesn't really change that. That's not the problem. Uh, the problem is the primary system. The problem is the governing system. The problem is the fundraising system. The problem is those problems. We've got to get to the root cause problems. And we got to, in the short run, as we're getting the hard stuff done, we've got to get more independents elected. And there's some really nice things now uh, being built to create infrastructure and to help independents and moderates get over those barriers to entry. Because right now, the party's got them by the throat. The party controls the money. The party controls uh, the blessing of all the party infrastructure, the vote-getting exercises, all the voter data. All that's captured by the party. We've got to create an offset. We've got to create a vehicle for a third way uh, in the election process. Now, I, I want to just take one more second on this last point. So many of us in this room believe deeply in philanthropy uh, and social change. Uh, and uh, I, I believe that uh, we need to keep doing that. And that's one of the things that makes America great. It makes other societies great. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I always am so excited to come here. Because I'm normally, you know, dealing with a bunch of, you know, business people that are just talking about, you know, how to make a profit, okay? It's very excited to be in this group. I know a lot of you are business people, too. I, I love business people, by the way. Uh, because I think business can change the world if it thinks about changing the world through its business. But, you know, we've got to see that there's another kind of philanthropy <laughs> that most of us haven't even thought about. And that's what you might call political philanthropy. I mean, you know, uh, I, I, the, uh, the, there's so much giving that's going on in our country. But if you add up all the philanthropy in America, I think it's about $400 billion a year. Um, I think it takes the federal government to spend $400 billion in 
three weeks. And it takes a state government, maybe a big state government, it takes a state government to spend $400 billion maybe in 13 weeks. What point am I making? The point is that unless we can get our public government structure to work, unless we can get all those public resources directed in the things that matter for our society, we're not going to offset that with private philanthropy trying to solve those problems ourselves. We've got to fundamentally get our government to work. I think that's what I've come to understand. I never thought the government was important. I thought it was a sideshow, uh, you know, uh, but it's not. We don't need government to necessarily, you know, run social institutions. But we need government to make good choices and support and encourage and incent the right steps and the right behavior that we need to move society forward. And in, in every field that we represented in this room, you're all in a lot of different fields. And, and those are all different in different fields. But we have to have a governmental process that, that allows us to to really put our weight and our energy behind those things. And we can't just say, oh, well, we'll just give privately and we'll just ignore government. Um, and I, I think what I've come to, 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 to believe at this moment in history is I've got to devote a lot of my energy to this issue. And I think we're, start, we're going to start to understand how to do that. We're going to start to understand how to start moving this rather than just throw up our hands and saying, oh, this is the way it's always going to be. Uh, we can change the way the political systems work. But it's not going to happen naturally. It's not going to happen spontaneously. It's not self-correcting. Because it's all baked into structural choices and rules and processes that have been put in place uh, without our even knowing about it. So let me, let me uh, thank you for letting me go a little bit over Hopefully, this is um, uh, 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 something that we can now build into the school dialogue. And uh, you know, I think, and I think over the last uh, day or two, we've had a lot of discussions about about a lot of the symptoms here. But actually, they're symptoms. And populism is a symptom. Uh, hate speech is a symptom. Divisiveness is a symptom. Uh, we don't have to. Uh, throw up our hands and talk in very general terms about how do, how do we be nicer to each other. You know, I think we have to start understanding what is underlying the dialogue, the behavior, the, the, the things that we're seeing in the world right now, uh, and what do we actually do to actually get in there and change that. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, and we'll open it up for discussion. I told you and warned you it would be provocative. So I'm going to push you just for a second um, out of your comfort zone. Okay. But, but sort of. I can't get any far out of my comfort zone. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> just a little bit of a postscript. So since the 2010 Tea Party wave, there's been a steady upward trend, as you sort of alluded to, in reelecting House members. And as you noticed um, and noted, Congress has really gotten more bitterly divided and frankly less productive. So just bear with me on a couple of geeky numbers here just to help put the context. So when the Tea Party wave happened in 2010, uh, the previous re-election rate of House members had been 94, but it dropped down to 85%. Immediately there was redistricting. 2012, it was 90% re-election rate for House members who ran. 2014, 95%, and this past November, 97%. And the Senate has stayed above 80% uh, every cycle since 2008. So what, with all of that in mind, is the citizen responsibility, and how does change happen if there's just this pattern of, oh, I don't like my congressman, except my congressman's okay, it's all the others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Um you know, I think I think uh, uh, I think at some level we we've got the we got to have the public start uh, understanding that this structure of government is not working for us, and um, 
And, and even when we think it is, it really isn't. Uh, and, and uh, you know, unfortunately, so many Republicans, and I, I'm, a, I'm a Massachusetts Republican, which is like a Kiwi extinct species, you know, but, <laughs> but, but, but you know, so I, I'm, you know, pre, pre-centrist, but um, we, we've, got, we've got to understand that if we're Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter. We may think we're scoring some points or we're winning some battles, but ultimately we're losing the war the war of moving America forward. And as long as we have the inherent premises and the inherent uh, processes and the inherent uh, thoughts about what, what we want our political system to look like, uh, we're, we're not gonna change that. So I think, we, I think the first thing we have to get Americans to understand and, and, any, and any other country that has these issues is that uh, the system actually isn't working for us. Even if we want control. Uh, the, the Democrats won control, you know, at the beginning of Obama. Didn't help. Not much happened. It was a stalemate. The Republicans just won control. Time will tell. My prediction. Not much will happen. Uh, Trump is an outsider, but, you know, what we're going to find is he's going to have tremendous problem getting anything done. Even as, you know, uh, irreverent as he is. And uh, so I think, I think Americans have to come to that realization that this isn't working for us. And then they have to start thinking that this is not natural. <laughs> that, that what we see here today is not just what it, what it is. I, we, have too, we, have, we have too often the idea that it's like fish being in water. You don't notice the water, you know. And we sort of have gotten used to this. And, and we, we can't allow this to be normal. And, and then we have to start educating ourselves about what are the critical steps uh, that would actually make a difference. And there is a substantial political reform movement popping up uh, all, over the, all over America. Uh, more and more resources are pouring into this area. More and more philanthropists are starting to look at this because it's starting to dawn on, on many of them and many of us that, that we've, we've got to take this issue on. So it, it's, 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 it's not, uh, it, it's, the, we, we, it's taken a long time to kind of get to the level that this is a kind of the first order issue, but I think we're there now, and hopefully the Trump election was sufficiently, um, uh, I state to use a word that, that I can't afford, I don't want to offend everybody or anybody, but uh, it, it, that it's, we're in a sufficiently distressed situation. <laughs> Uh, that this, this is actually something we got to do something about, pay attention. So, Edith, I didn't quite answer your question, but I, I did the best I could. Okay. Uh, and so probably uh, to set up the audience, uh, why don't you talk a little bit about what role business can play in all yep. this? Because you alluded to Citizens United, the yep. Supreme Court decision, which yep. sort of very simply loosened the restrictions on, on donations. We don't have time to get into all the nuances. Yep. Yeah. But yeah. the role of business. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, I think uh, the role of business, uh, business has taken two tracks on political involvement. Um, one track is um, dropping out. Uh, a lot of business leaders that I work with don't, don't want anything to do with this. They don't see any way to win. They see it as a lose. Uh, they hunker down, they keep their profile low, they might give a little uh, political donations, but they, 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 those donations are mostly just so that people will talk to them, <laughs> uh, so they can make their case uh, for uh, avoiding uh, bad things. Um, that's that's the, the best of the bad <laughs> business response. Uh, the, the worst business response is business has understood that this is a game where the special interests uh, are the most powerful customers. And so business has turned into a special interest. And they've learned how to play the game. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of industries have massive budgets for lobbying and, and political uh, action. And uh, a lot of the people on the House uh, Health Care Committee, I'm just making it up, there is no health, but the committee that covers, a lot of the people that work in that area uh, work in the industry when they retire. <laughs> And we have sort of this revolving door between political uh, leaders and the industries in which they've been asked to regulate and provide. And if they're nice to the industry, they get a job. So we have, we have, these, two, um, we have these two ways in which the business community has, has responded. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, shame, on, shame on us as a business community. 
Uh, we, the business community has not taken this on. I think the business community is, is hopefully going to be um, uh, uh, sufficiently uh, interested now in the direction our country is going in that's sufficiently bad that we'll, we'll see a change in, in, uh, in, in track. One of my major goals with this work and the paper uh, that will be published, there was a short three-page three version in Fortune magazine about uh, three or four weeks ago. So that's a little kind of summary. Uh, one of my major focuses here is on the business community because I, I think we need the business community to, uh, to play the role, uh, their traditional role, or more traditional role of, 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 of trying to be a sort of force to uh, move this uh, system in, in another direction. But I, I, I'm not going to hold my breath because it's very scary for a business person to not you know, kind of be nice <laughs> to the parties. And uh, so uh, we'll, we'll see. But I, I'm, I'm hopeful the business community will understand that the way we've been doing it isn't working. It's not working for business. Business wants tax reform. Business wants infrastructure reform. Business wants health care reform. Business wants all the stuff that isn't happening too. Uh, and hopefully business leaders will start to realize that we just can't play this game anymore. We, we've, got, we've got to realize that we have to change it. Uh, time will tell. All right, with that, let's go to your questions, and there are microphones, but you in the third row there. If you, you, yeah, they'll pass the mic down there. Hello, Professor. Hi. Uh, my name's Danny, and I'm a PhD student in politics. So, oh, yes, uh, good. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> He's going to make me look like softball. Yeah, I, I've, read, I've read a lot of the literature in politics, yeah. I've uh, critiqued a question for you. Yep. Uh, one, uh, you allude several times in many of the things you say about we know exactly what to do. We all agree. Uh, I'm certainly sympathetic to, I believe, your political opinions, and I think most of the room is as well. But I think we have to confront potentially a reality that most, many people, not just in the United States, but also around the world, are not in agreement with what constitutes social progress. And that mm -hmm. what we think is progress really isn't. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have ideas to, to deal with that. Yep. And secondly, a question about uh, what I guess we could call future shock, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but an idea of political future shock, where society is so much more nimble and businesses and technology and democratization of information is so much more nimble than government institutions that is there maybe a natural speed limit for how fast society can progress? Because mm -hmm. I think that's obviously what you said we're all here for. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, th those, are, those, are, uh, those are excellent points. Um, I mean, there is a large school of thought that says that it's not politics that's causal, but it's the, just the fracturing of citizens. And we are, you know, we are becoming tribal, you know, e even in our advanced economies. I, I am less convinced by that argument. I, I think that uh, a lot of the divisiveness and disagreement and, uh, you know, inability to have any, you know, serious open mind about anything has really been taught to us. That the kind of nature of the political dialogue and, and what, what our political leaders say and how they, how they operate and how they act and all those emails they're sending every two days during the election. And, and that whole process has, has, in a sense, taught us to have a ineffective and, uh, you know, uh, uh, un, 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 not based on fact kind of discussion in society. And there's just so many lies and so much fake stuff. And uh, there's so many false choices that get posed. And, and now with the media changing, I mean, we used to have a much more independent media. If you go back 20 or 30 years, and, and now the media, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the media, not, not Edith, by the way, <laughs> uh, but a lot, of the media, a lot of the media is aligning with one side or the other. And if you look at what happened in this last election and how much advertising money poured into the media, for all these shows on CNN and CSNBC and Fox and 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 all these people, and it was all it was all the same stuff. It was the oh these guys are the enemy. They're crazy. They're wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is bad. This is bad. 
and I, so I think, I think right now it's, it's uh, I, I, I am not clear that citizens are the root cause. Uh, I, I think citizens are not always that well educated, but I think a lot of the beliefs that people have have been shaped by what they've heard and, and, and what, they've been, uh, what they've been taught. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that if we had a different kind of uh, political process where the two people contesting in the election were both moderates, or centrist, they were on the hook and defined success as getting something done. They were willing to compromise if they were good arguments, uh, that we would have a very different dialogue and a very different discussion, and, and I think we, we might be able to uh, make much more progress. Uh, but uh, again, this, this is an issue which we're, we're going to need to ponder and study and, and work on for, for years to come. This is, uh, this is just as complicated as economic development or, uh, uh, you know, social progress. Uh, there's, there, and there's a lot of complexity. One of the things I said, I want to say it again, there's no simple answer to any of the important issues facing our society. We are very pressed for time. So we're going to ask for the lady here in the third row and then the, the gentleman with his hand in the fifth row. And I apologize to the back. The lights are kind of blinding. But let's tackle these two, and then we'll see where we are for time, please. Well, first, thank you, Professor Porter. This was both very depressing and very inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, my name thank is you Roberta. for that second part. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think that, that there's a wake-up call that's going, going on in America with citizens. Um, but I, I'm, um, I'd like to, uh, I'm a recovering in investigative reporter who left journalism and is now looking at stories about companies doing things right, who's doing it, you know, business for good, Move, and it's a movement. You said business can change the world and that you love business um, and that business is working, working harder than ever to move the needle on social issues. When I did a Neiman Fellowship at Harvard, one of the things that I was very, that, has, that I've been marinating on for 15 years, and I, I realize it's heretical to say it, but um, what if business had linked prosperity? And, and you know, kind of what Ben and Jerry's did before they got bought out, where the lowest paid worker on the factory floor couldn't make less than nine times the CEO, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the, the the most challenging thing in America and in the world right now is the chasm between rich and poor. Mm -hmm. And so if there was a leveling, I mean, think of all the money. I mean, why does a CEO have to make, you know, take a mm -hmm. $15 yep. million dollar bonus mm -hmm. um, and be firing people in the factory at the yep. same time? Well, I think that's a, a sensational question. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I think that uh, the... Yeah, the kind of market system and the in, investor and the shareholder uh, pressures and all those things have have uh, have have pushed business to see beyond, in a way, its own self-interest. Um, and uh, I think the the uh, paying your your lower lower wage workers a, a salary that doesn't allow them to live <laughs> uh, just doesn't make sense for the company. <laughs> Uh, and you have you have massive turnover, and you have people that you know are not can't do their job, and are not good on the front line, and are not able to engage and provide good support and service to your customers. And and I think I think that tide is starting to turn. Uh, we had a lot of companies voluntarily uh, raising raising I income. I mean, even Walmart. Walmart has made a stunning transformation in its workforce practices, and. It's now, tr it, it, it's training, it's career development, it's providing its companies with, a, its employees with a, you know, six or seven year career path, it's, it's, it's raising their wages, it's all kinds of stuff that they're doing. So I think we're, we're starting to see the glimmer in the business community of going beyond just philanthropy, giving money, you know, being good citizens and all that, and uh, this notion of shared value that, that I believe very deeply in that we introduced a number of years ago, I think that's taking hold. Uh, I think it's it, it's it's working its way now through lots of the behavior of companies. So, I my my view is unlike the political system. I think the corporate sector is on a positive path at this point. Um, and uh, but that said, we've got to hold the business community accountable, 
And we got to keep raising these questions. I mean, it doesn't, you know, why do you need this bonus, you know? And, and uh, you know, why, what's the board doing? And, and uh, why should shareholders think that's a good idea? And I, I think, you know, we need people to be well compensated. We need to recognize, you know, how scarce and important CEOs are. But, but I, think, I think we've overshot. And uh, uh, so I think, I think business is going to have to adjust. Uh, but I, I believe that, uh, uh, you know, and hopefully that'll make things easier, but I, I think the political, this political uh, system issue, uh, at least in America, which I, I have now immersed myself in for, for some time, um, I think has, uh, we, we've got to tackle that because unless we tackle that, we're going to have a hard time uh, ma making the progress. I mean, what will be fascinating for me is how many of you for, that are not Americans, and you live somewhere else, and you're in a different political system, how many echoes of what I've been talking about do you perceive? And what is the structure that's been created in your country? I mean, when I think of, of the UK, for example, and I think of Brexit, wow. That was based on lies. The citizens didn't understand. It was Alice in Wonderland. You know, immigrants help Britain. They don't hurt. They did understand. That's why they voted that way. But they voted to get, they voted against uh, what was in their interest. So the last question, because the professor has a plane to catch, goes so to your curse, your the man the with the microphone. Group, once described as the last bastion of independent reporting in the UK by The Guardian, if The Guardian are here, thank you. Just a quick thing. Did he say he was Guardian? No, he said the BBC. Oh, BBC, good. No, we like that. No, me. No, big issue. Oh, big issue, sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, just a quick comment on the social uh, progress imperative, the SPI. Absolutely brilliant. You can separate economic out from social outcomes because then we can really see what we're doing in terms of policy. We manage and advise on 150 million pounds of social investment funds and we can actually see where we're going to invest and what it does. And I think it's an absolutely brilliant initiative and proud to be working with them. Thank you. Um, uh, as, an, uh, as a Brit talking about America, can I just quote a famous Brit? Um, sure. Who said, a long habit of a not thinking a thing wrong gives it the superficial appearance of being right. Tom Paine, Common Sense, 1776. Absolutely brilliant. And I think we can apply that to democracy. And I think one of the problems is, is what we've done and perhaps we have to be more radical than what you're saying, is because it's not, in my view, it's no point reforming a representative democracy. Actually, what we need to be doing is forging a participatory democracy. And I think just making it better, and making it better for people to say, look, trust in me, I'll do it for you, actually will lead to things like Mr. T and Brexit. We need to create a participatory democracy. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, and I would believe that citizens, in a way, have withdrawn from, most citizens have withdrawn from the political process. They're not engaged in any productive way. Uh, they, sometimes they vote, but that, that's kind of it, and except for a very small number of people that uh, is very purposefully engaged around, uh, you know, their particular self-interest. And... Uh, and, and they don't believe in compromise, and they don't believe in anything else. This is, they get up every day, and this is their life, is this issue and this interest. And you're absolutely right. A lot of, a lot of citizens have withdrawn from democracy. We take it for granted. We, we just assume that it's a good system. And, uh, and, you know, it historically was, you know, it's gone, it has its ups and downs. But at least in America, we, it, our system worked, you know, reasonably well. And if you look back at our landmark legislation in America over the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, Medicare, uh, Civil Rights Act, and so forth, we had a huge majority vote for those le legislation. Because at the end of the day, people said, this is good for us, you know, Democrats and Republicans. Today, if you look at major legislation, you know how much it wins by. One vote, two votes. You know, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, had zero Republican votes. And there's a lot of other important legislation that had zero Democratic votes. And that's, we, we've kind of evolved to the place where um, we've kind of lost our way in terms of what the purpose of democracy really is. 
but and, but but I, I think I think the sophistication and, and the the computers and the voter data and the, uh, the the media communication systems and the social media and all these things have allowed the actors in the political process who are worried about their own success to kind of optimize and shift and migrate what politics really is uh, to be a very, very weak version of what I think most of us think it is. If you look underneath the, the hood here, it, it's pretty ugly. And uh, I think uh, we, we're going to have to take it back. I agree with you. Uh, I think part of that is, is participation. Uh, and I think part of it is we have, to, uh, we have to change some of the rules and practices that have been put in place that nobody intended uh, be created. But, but like every other part of society and every other business, you know, people get smart. They figure it out. They figure out how to do it better. They figure out how to strengthen their power, their clout, their influence, their ability to get what they want and need from their perspective. And that's happened in, in politics as well. At least that, that's the way we see it. But that, thank you for that. That's a, that's, a, that's a very thoughtful comment. I really appreciate it. So we know you have a plane to catch? Unfortunately, I, I have a day job, as they call it. Uh, You're headed back to? Tomorrow at Harvard Business School. Cold and snowy Boston. So thanks to the professor. He has a couple of notes that he wanted me to share. While the professor gathers his things, he wanted me to share a couple of, of notes with you. The, the presentation slides will be, uh, well, they are available online, and the recording will be available next week. Uh, both of them can be found at www.socialprogress.org. Um, the long-form article, uh, Problems Unsolved and a Nation Divided, will be released in mid-April, so look out for that. Uh, everyone is welcome to join a group of international change agents convening later this month in Iceland. That's April 24th to 26th uh, for what works a global summit to advance social progress. And uh, you saw the professor referred to the 2016 numbers, the 2017 social progress index and latest analysis of the United States' social and environmental performance will be released next month in May. And lastly, um, all of you in the audience, would you be please so kind as to fill out your survey cards uh, before you leave the room? And with that note, again, thank you and good evening. Thank you so much.